ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Nola Wanta and I am the Senior Director of Business Development and Strategy at LME's College of Business Administration. I'm here to just help facilitate um, the, the webinar and to start us off. So we'll start with just our webinar guidelines for tonight. So um, during the webinar, please feel free to type your questions in the Q&A window. These questions will be moderated after the presentation. There's also an upvote option. So if you see a question already asked that you like, just use the thumbs up and um, our moderator will be sure to address those questions. Also use the chat window to post your comments only and, and we'll respond to them as necessary. And just as a friendly reminder that this webinar is being recorded and will be available after the presentation. And with that, I'd like to introduce our Dean of our College of Business Administration, Dean Dale Smith, who will introduce us and get us started. Thank you, Nola. And on behalf of the College of Business Administration, welcome to another CBA event offered to provide our students, our alumni, our alumni and other friends of the just-in-time knowledge to keep pace with the rapid change in the business environment. Um, I'd like to take just a second to thank the Real Estate Advisory Council, what we call the REIC, in sponsoring tonight's webinar and for their work to develop real estate programming at LMU in our CBA, for they bring LMU alumni, parents, and friends together regularly, and for the work that all the members of the REIC are doing to help prepare and support our students who are interested in real estate careers. Given the dramatic changes due to a COVID environment, this is an exciting time to be in the real estate sector, both for the challenges that we're facing, as well as the many opportunities for those who develop those key skills in analysis and ability to pivot. It is now my pleasure to introduce one of our REIC members, Carlo Matricardi. Carlo is a 2003 graduate of LMU and the CBA. He's been on the REIC for several years and he's a member of our REIC's executive board. He is the managing director at Carthay, a commercial real estate service here, right here in LA. And uh, please join me in welcoming Carlo, who will introduce our speaker tonight. Carlo, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dean Dale Smith. We really appreciate uh, your kind words and your support of uh, REIC. Um, thank you so much to the LMU staff as well for putting together our marketing and coordinating this, this entire event series. Again, this event is uh, produced by the LMU Real Estate uh, Advisory Council, or REIC, which provides guidance, advice, and feedback to the LMU College of Business Administration on business and employment trends in real estate. The council offers direction on how to improve real estate curriculum and partners with the Real Estate Society, a student-led group, to organize extracurricular activities, educate LMU students about careers in real estate and current trends. As our speaker might say, we cook what we eat. And REIC is proud to provide annual scholarships to selective students who are interested in the real estate industry. We recently funded a certificate program, training courses for students to help them uh, be better prepared for jobs in the commercial real estate industry. We're looking for additional council members and invite those interested to reach out to Evan Deems at Core Trust. His contact will be in the chat. In addition, uh, any current students should contact Coleman Anderson to become a member of the Real Estate Society to learn more about events. And they have a great uh, monthly speaker series just for students. Turning to our, our main event, we are very fortunate to have uh, Chris Rising who earned his JD in 96. He is the co-founder and CEO of Rising Realty Partners, an owner and operator of over 5 million square feet of Class A office buildings and retail assets uh, centered in downtown Los Angeles. In addition to creating a very successful investment platform, Chris is the host of The Real Market, the only podcast that brings the real estate conference to your headphones. You can find those episodes at chrisrising.com and hear more from thought leaders in our real estate industry. Without further ado, we are very honored uh, to host Chris Rising to the Loyola Marymount University's College of Business Administration. Over to you, Chris. <laughs> Thank you. That was that was quite an introduction, and I and I really appreciate it. Um, I uh, find it kind of uh, overwhelming that that. Loyola Marymount would want me to be a part of all of this. I uh, um, went to Loyola Marymount uh, for law school, but I also went to Loyola High School 
um, have great affection for the university and the law school. My, my father served on the board for a while um, when, when he was running Playa Vista and then uh, was, was um, spent, I think, about eight years uh, as LMU planned its campus and all the things there. So I, I have a long affinity for it. And unfortunately, Pat Cahalan passed away recently, but Father Cahalan, who was the president out there for a long time, or the chancellor, I think, was his title, um, was a dear friend. So I, I really appreciate you having me on. I, I'll give whatever words of wisdom you think appropriate. Um, uh, you know, uh, if you want to guide me out of start, but I have some thoughts as well. So you, you tell me, Carlo, you want to start with some questions? Well, or should well I, 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 I think just, um, you know, you gave us a, a great background on, on how you got your start. Um, let's do this. We're, we're in a, we're in a moment when I believe people need to pivot. Um, you know, I've been a great fan of your podcast. One of the, one of the quotations that I got here from, from you and Keith talking, uh, Keith Wasserman over at Gelt was just because it's cheap doesn't mean it's good. <laughs> That's a good one. I, I'm a big fan of Keith Wasserman and his wife, uh, who has her own uh, development, multifamily development. But I think there's a lot of things we can we can look at right now, and I and I think it's important that people understand that we are in a recession. I'm I, I've, we have never been in a situation where we're in a pandemic and a recession, but we are in a recession, and and um, one of the things that comes out in the recession is people get very, um, if they have any ch access to capital, they start to drool and start to think, well, just because something's cheap, um, I can justify it. And that's just not the case. And I think it, that's kind of the groundwork for a bigger talk about, about real estate in general and what we're going through, which is, um, I'll start with this. We are in just an unprecedented times. I, I've been, I've, I, my father got in the real estate business in the 70s. He was a lawyer as well um, and uh, got into it when the Pennsylvania Railroad had a bankruptcy and uh, a gentleman named Victor Palmieri, um, who had been at O'Melveny and Myers, started this uh, company to go and help on bankruptcies. My dad came over and ran Coda de Casa. I tease him still to this day that if, it, if he hadn't done the water deal that allowed the development of Coda de Casa, we would never have had the Housewives of Orange County. Um, so I really blame him for that. But my point is, is that he got into the business in a time when we had bankruptcies. Um, I got into the business in, uh, when I, in 90, early 90s. I graduated from law school in 96, but I was around real estate because my dad was in it. And I still remember the term, uh, stay alive till 95, you know, after the, a lot of people probably weren't born who were on this call when this happened. But when the SNL crisis happened and the tax laws changed, the early 90s were terrible. And then I was very much in the real estate business in the early 2000s when we had the tech wreck and um, watched real estate prices in, of all places, San Francisco, just plummet. Um, and then I lived through 2008 and we started our company in 2011. So it is a business that is very cyclical and you have to understand that. And I think one of the things when someone is young in real estate, um, they get very, they're thinking about all these great things I can do, but if you don't know how to live off a of salary, it's very hard to be in the real estate business. And what I mean by that, you could be commissioned like a broker, or you could be in my position where, look, my employees get paid before I do. That's just the way it goes, right? And um, recessions cause that punch to the gut of, wow, this is harder than I thought. <laughs> you get a few wins, you think this business is easy, and then so I like that you started with that quote because just buying something cheap doesn't mean you're going to be successful. There's a whole lot of other things that go with it. Um, I think one of the things we want to talk about tonight is if you're a young person who's, who's interested in real estate, like how do I get there? I will tell you during a recession is probably the best time you can get in there because you can offer things to people. Um, very few times is I will, uh, do, do the things like I'll work really hard um, mean a whole lot in a good economy because like, well, everybody's going to work hard. But when you have, when you're in a bad economy and people just need help and you can take an internship or you can offer your time at, at say a minimum wage to do certain things and you work really hard, you can impress someone to be in real estate because real estate is a, um, the most complicated business I've been in. Or I, and I've invested in a few other businesses here and there. So complicated. And it really does take um, a dedication and, a, and an ability to go through cycles. 
you know, if you go and practice law, which I, I as a lawyer, I, I know I, I don't practice, but it's less cyclical in that business. If you're going into being an accountant, it's a little less cyclical than if you're a real estate professional. And um, unfortunately, I think we're going to have uh, a very, very tough 2021. It takes a while for the stuff to come through the system. And you go from March and here we are in November. And I can tell you that there is just very little activity on the office side. Um, if you're in multifamily and industrial, it's kind of a different story. But if you're in office and hotel, these are these are the toughest times I've seen. I think they'll end up being tougher than the GFC. So um, taking it back to just buying something cheap, is it doesn't mean you're going to be successful. Um, uh, it can go a few other ways, but if you want to, if you think there's a question Cer or two, do you think it would be? No, no, certainly. Um, with that said, I, th I think that uh, touching on experience and opportunities to get into the business. If I were to look at your, your podcast at the profiles, maybe 25% of the people are within the real estate brokerage community. You have mm -hmm. experience in that. And I know that you yeah. have um, some strong insight as to uh, the value of commercial real estate brokers and or advisors, uh, people who service the industry. If you could yeah. provide your thoughts. Okay. Yeah, you know, I think when I was coming out of school, it was the tail end of, hey, if you could just be a runner for somebody in brokerage, that's a great entry into the business. I don't necessarily agree with that anymore because I think real estate has gotten more sophisticated. Doesn't mean that I don't think, I mean, quite frankly, I could have my lawyer calling me, my lender calling me, or a broker with a tenant calling me. I'm going to take the broker with the tenant call every time first. Everybody else will call back. So I'm not saying it's not important, but I think it's such a highly specialized business when you go into brokerage. At the end of the day, brokerage is all about having a client. It's not as important whether you know the in, ins and outs of real estate because you can get that support at a CB or a CNW. It's what I found in the years that I was a broker that the people who were best at brokerage weren't necessarily the best to break down what a good real estate deal was. They were the best because they were really good at sales and they had really good relationships. They were also people who just had it in their stomach where they could take one commission check in January and be able to live off of it for 10 months. And that takes a special something. And um, so I'm not discouraging people to get into it, but I will say that, that office leasing and office um, uh, industrial leasing, there's not a high barrier to entry. You don't have to have a ton of skill set. So what I often tell people, if you want to get into the real estate business, I would look a little bit more at the finance side. I would look at getting some skill set um, that is actually saleable. And for us in the office side, there's a software program called Argus. <clears throat> you can go online and take a, a class and you can get a certification. And we really look for that for interns. Like if you're certified in Argus, I know I can pay you to do a job. And then that opens up your world into things. Um, as much as I loved being a lawyer, and that was my kind of entry in, I, I went from being a lawyer doing leasing and purchase and sale agreements over to working for John Cushman and being his kind of chief of staff. I had to then, at 28 or 30, go take classes at UCLA because I just didn't have the finance background to be able to do what I do now. And, and um, so there is something about having a skill set that I think is more important today than it was, say, in the 80s, uh, 70s and 80s. So I would highly recommend to people that we live in an age where you can do so many things on the internet, go get a certification, go get something so that when you go apply for an internship or a job, you're bringing value from day one. You're not just saying, I'm going to work hard and I'll try to learn the business. Um, I think that's really valuable today. And I think the other thing that's happening in real estate is technology is starting to consume the business. We're the we're the, probably the last major in, industry to get there, um, but we're getting there and we're getting there fast. Prop tech is, is really taking over. And I'm noticing more and more um, that older people in the business who haven't adjusted, boy, the world is just passing them by really quick. So if you have an acumen with um, technology and can apply that towards real estate software, that's a huge advantage. And um, so I, talking about Keith, um, who's a young man who I really have great respect for, 
he's taken social media to a level on his fundraising. Um, and it always gets, you know, scary on, on, on the rules about it, but I've been really impressed about how he's taken his track record to social media to raise money. But I know he didn't do it just on his own. He's got people who really understand how to do it. So that's another entry in that probably wasn't there 15 years ago. It was an acumen for social media, an acumen for business software and real estate software. Excellent, thank you. You attended Loyola High School here in Los Angeles. You attended LMU, both Jesuit uh, schools, both Jesuit education. What's the through line for the Jesuit education for you and how it applies to the business? Yeah, well, I spent most of my uh, life very indoctrinated into um, the Loyola High School of being a person for others. Um, I think that goes through very well in, uh, with LMU, both for the undergrad and for the, for the graduate, that, uh, for whether you're an MBA or you're at the law school, which is you really have to think about yourself in a bigger sense than just yourself. You, it, a real estate deal only gets done is if you're working with the community, if you're working with other people within the business uh, market. And so being a person for others is a, is a big through line for me. I, I would also say that obviously USC has a big community and, I, and I, I'm not saying anything bad about USC, um, but I think there's a uniqueness to the Loyola um, Jesuit education here in, in Southern California. And I do think there's a, there's a brotherhood, sisterhood within uh, Loyola Marymount that, you know, you call somebody, you say, hey, this is where I went and this is what I've done. It opens doors in a way that is really valuable. And, and I think it's different than, than an SC background. And I'm not, I'm, even though I grew up in a UCLA family, I went to Duke, but um, I, I grew up in a UCLA family. I just think it's different. And I think it's a special community and as I look at what's happened at LMU over the last 15, 20 years, boy, has its reputation grown um, across the country and across the world. And I think that it's really something valuable. And so I would have no, I would encourage everybody to try to use that network because I think it's an important one. Agreed. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. I believe it was Thomas Barrick, who was uh, someone else who I look up to, uh, who said that also uh, law background, who said that real estate is a business of contracts. You also come from a, from a law background. Yeah. What is your take on that? Um, yeah, I would agree. I think the greatest skill set I learned from being a lawyer, um, I just, I just never spent time on, uh, doing the litigation side of things. I always was more drawn to the business deal side. I loved my tax classes. Um, I loved I loved anything that was about transactional business. And it, it, I learned a very important lesson as a law student and a young lawyer that, you know, read a contract with your finger underneath the line because you read every word. And I think in real estate, that's extraordinarily important. Um, real world case, we're, we're working on a deal right now where the tenant, um, if we were to put in and install some of this higher end HVAC equipment, we're saying we should get something back. And, and the reason I think it's relevant is it's all gonna be in the operating expense provisions. And so as a, with my lawyer background on our team, I very much focus people on that. And so I thought that, I think that's important. You know, I, brought, I bring that, that's what I can bring to the table is that contracts are important. I will tell you that I think that the most important thing though, beyond that is you really have to have not ex exceptional, but solid math skills. Because at the end of the day, a real estate deal either pencils on the back of a, a napkin or it doesn't. And if it doesn't, no amount of spreadsheets are gonna get it there. So if it doesn't work on a per square foot basis, going into Argus or going to these other things. So I, I do think you have to have, um, you have to be comfortable with numbers. You just you can't do it with the moves. You can't just think you can hype something up and get it done. You've got to understand the contract. You've got to understand the numbers. And it, 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 there's just no way around it. And, um, uh, you know, it's not I, – I, I, my podcast, I talk a lot about the creativity and working with architects. All that is very important. But you don't get to get there if the contracts don't work and if the numbers don't work. 100%. I think um... – 
that's one of the, well, I mean, it's much more interesting here. You talk about the differentiating factor for uh, rising and how you think your company is set apart from perhaps other operators and or investors. Well, I think it's, uh, the, the biggest one by far is the fact that the backbone of the company is on technology. <clears throat> when we started in, in 2011, I'd just come out of working for a public REIT for two years and extraordinarily frustrated with the amount of paper and the wasted time and the idea that you could only have meetings in the office because that's where the paper was and all that stuff. So we started our business in 2011, 2012, and the idea that we were paperless, on the idea that we would use project management software rather than email. And, um, and when you think that way, I think it leads you to try to solve problems in a way that others don't. Um, you know, one of the things that became a big deal for us early on was broadband. And so we started a telecom company because we were frustrated with AT&T and, and Verizon. And all of our projects, we pride ourselves on that we have the fastest internet, the fastest Wi-Fi, uh, most secure Wi-Fi and all that. And all that came from our use of technology. And, and I think that really makes us a different company. I would also tell you that people are catching up real quick, real quick. But it used to be that I would make fun of people who would print off their emails and think that they were somehow technologically profi proficient. Now I kind of make fun of people if they, if they interact only on email uh, within their company because there's no way to track anything. There's no way to have a record. And so I think that, that, that use of technology has really been a big game changer for our company. And I think, I think the other thing is um, our willingness to take some risks that others might not. And, you know, it's tough when you're signing uh, non-recourse, but bad boy carve outs and you got guarantees out there, you gotta be careful. But some of our projects, our success was, we just said, well, let's just try it and let's rip out this wall and see what's there. Let's, uh, and I don't, you know, not every real estate company would do that. So I also want everyone to know that in the real world, you don't always hit a home run. And sometimes you make mistakes that can be painful, but I think our willingness to just try some things and um, that others weren't and recreate something and having a vision for what something was supposed to be. I, I, I firmly believe that when a build, whatever building you're talking about, your home, a condo project, an office building, there was an architect who had a vision and when it goes out of favor, when that project is not well leased, or the, the whole idea is how do you get it back to that vision and then improve it with a 21st century twist? And that's what we try to do all the time. Excellent. Um, you know, the, the name of this uh, talk is resilience. And one of the things that I, I think people really want to know is juxtaposing this cycle versus other cycles that you've been a part of, what keeps you up at night in this cycle? And, and which Everything. real estate asset class do you see big, being the biggest opportunity? Everything, I'm not sleeping much, I will tell you that. Um, well, it's because, you know, in a down cycle, what you realize is how much is out of your control. Um, we have a project in downtown LA that we've loved um, that you would think in COVID times would have lots of tours because it's an open air campus and, um, you know, you don't have to be in an elevator with anybody. Since March, we've had zero tours, no matter what we've tried. So uh, what happens in a recession is you start to realize how little you have in your control. Um, and when times are good, you're not, you know, maybe we're not as good as we thought they were. Times were just good and, and companies were growing. I mean, the thing about real estate, whether it's office, industrial, even multifamily and retail, <clears throat> you're successful because the economy is growing and because people need to rent an apartment or they need to rent space. When you go into recession like we're in now, and by the way, we're still in the pandemic. We're not even at the recession part yet. <clears throat> I mean, we, we just had a tenant, a major tenant tell us that they're not coming back for sure. No matter what happens, vaccine, it doesn't matter. They're not coming back until July of, of 2021. And you start to go, wow, you realize what's not in your control. So we go back to the only time I've ever had trouble in my real estate career is when we were over levered. And why do you get over levered? Because in a good time, someone offers you a lot of debt at very cheap prices and you say, okay, that'll never, I won't have a problem. I'll get at least and I'll, it'll be someone else's problem, but you don't get to predict when those things happen. I would say, I don't know if it keeps me up at night in the sense that I, I think office isn't coming back, 
I do think offense is coming back, and I wrote a whole white paper, which I'm proud to uh, be happy to share with everybody. But the average age of a CEO now is 51 years old, and a CFO is 47 years old. That is a change of generation. It's my generation. It's the Gen X generation. It's not the baby boomers. And what happens when new people come in? They're going to try new things. And right now, the mobile workforce is a big deal. Um, and I think you're going to see a lot of CEOs say, I'll take my shot and see if we don't need either as much or maybe we don't need any uh, office space. I personally believe we're human beings and we need interaction. And as great as this is, it doesn't replace if we were sitting over it, you know, on campus and having a meeting and we could talk. And after the talk, people could come up to me and blah, 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 blah. This doesn't replace that, but it's a good substitute. So when we get outside of the pandemic, I think office will come back, but I don't know. And it's really hard to go to investors who want me to give them all their all the answers. And I, all I can do is just be honest. I think what we're going to see is we're in a recession where you can cut costs or in two ways, cut employees, cut your fixed liability of real estate, get some sublease space up there. That's going to go for most of 2021. My hope is we'll have a nice stimulus package come out. The world will start to feel better. The vaccine will hit and you get towards the end of 2021 and life will start to come back. The one thing that makes me really convinced that life will come back is I have twin 15 and a half year old daughters who cannot wait to go back to the mall and go to a movie and do that. And so I don't think people will be paranoid forever, but you know, it, it's really the things I can't control. I, I never thought I would become uh, a reader of the Stoics the way I have since March. Because as Marcus Aurelius as you said, you know, you can't worry about things you can't control. So hopefully that answered it. <laughs> no, definitely. Uh, Aurelius Seneca, it's, it's all part of our reading assignment. If we could, <laughs> based on the, the, the current environment that we're in now, if you could go back and uh, tell yourself, as a student, if you could give yourself some advice, what, what would be the things to focus on? Well, that, that's a good question. I think about it a lot, especially having uh, high school age children and, and such. I think the number one is patience. Um, I, I think you have to really, you, you can work really hard and you can put in a good hard day of work, whether it's studying or whatever, but you need to be patient in this. But real estate is not buying and trading stocks. You know, I have friends who are in the money management business and all that stuff, and they, they can move their whole portfolio in one day. That's not how real estate works. It's an illiquid asset, no matter what you're in. And so you really have to be patient and you have to plan for a patient exit or patient entrance. And I never really understood that until I got a little bit older. Um, the other thing I would say is that, I may have said this earlier, but I, Somebody said something to me in my early 20s that I kind of laughed at, and I, it was someone I respected, but he said, you know, Chris, you can't do this on the moves. When you're young, you think you can talk your way through all this stuff, and you can just convince people. You can't. It's just too, it's too sophisticated a business, real estate is. There's too many layers of people, and just telling a good pitch isn't going to do it. You got to have the numbers behind it. You got to be able to have your comps behind it. You got to be able to convince people and you can't do it thinking you're the flashiest and the coolest. And, you know, we got a little press in 2015 when we did our PAC Mutual project about, you know, we brought creative office to downtown LA and all that. Well, I think we did a lot of things that allowed us to win competitions against other buildings for uh, leasing and all that. But 2015, the market was on fire. And so I, don't, I can't tell you if it was that we were that brilliant. I think we were ahead of our time a little bit, but you know, that same product right now, if you can't get tours there, you're not gonna be able to lease it. So I think you have to be humble enough to know that uh, it, as much as your success is gonna be at the right time in the market, timing is really important. And when you're young, I don't think you think that way. And, and I think that I, I would give people, I would, if I could summarize that, I'd say, Really do your homework, know your stuff inside and out, be patient with it, it doesn't happen overnight, and just be consistent, show up every day. It's not a Hollywood movie, it's not, none of this stuff, there's not a big premiere night where everyone goes, that's gonna be a hit, uh, you know, a hit and you're gonna make a bunch of money. It's very steady and slow in real estate. Excellent, it's not a movie premiere, it's not a single event, I, I couldn't yeah. agree more. Um, 
I'm, I'm actively looking at questions from folks that are out there. I appreciate your questions, everyone. I had a question come through. Um, uh, interested to discuss as a community of real estate pro professionals, space making, community building. How can we come to, and this is a very difficult question, but very apropos, and you've spoken to this, I appreciate, uh, through your podcast many times uh, and, and tried to tackle these questions. Um, how can we come together to address homelessness? What are the right questions to even ask for, for this issue? Well, I'll tell you that the saddest thing about homelessness, uh, in my opinion, here in Southern California, is how predictable it was. Um, that we would get to a uh, position where housing would become unaffordable um, because the development process is so difficult. I am a big believer. I mean, maybe anybody knows anything about me, impact investing and doing things. I mean, I really care about climate change and all of these things. So I think these are things we have to consider uh, and they have to be a part of the equation. But the fact is we haven't built enough housing for people in this state and it's been going on for too long so at some point we're just going to have to bite the bullet and not and figure out a way to end nimbyism we got it we have to stop someone saying if a project comes into my neighborhood it's going to change my neighborhood in a way and i want my neighborhood to stay the same no matter what because that is that is the key problem uh is we don't have enough housing unfortunately the second thing does, it doesn't have as much to do with homelessness as it does uh with our healthcare system, we just have too many people who have addictions or mental health problems. And, and in my family, my sister uh, um, suffered from anxiety, uh, drug addiction, mental disorder. If it wasn't for two parents who could take care of her, she would have been on the street at 20. So I think we have to, as a society, deal with those things. And I think, uh, I think I don't know what I can do about the second one, I know in the first one, you know, it's not greedy developers trying to build a 50-story structure uh, that I'm talking about. And I'm not saying they're greedy, but I'm saying that's what people say. I'm talking about the, the, the group that wants to build a five-story workforce-centered housing development that right now can't get that approved in cities because of nimbyism, because they want to keep people, you know, single-family home neighborhoods. Boy, if we allow a a multi-tenant thing over here that's going to lead to this. So I think there's going to be some draconian answers to this. I think the governor and the state are going to really take away some local control that most communities have always had because they just can't get it done. I mean, look at our city council. I mean, I mean, I mean the judge, a judge has said, we, you have to move people out from under freeways. That is not, you can't do it. And they can't even agree on a plan on how they're going to do it. And I mean, I don't know if the judge has to send council people to jail because we have to change these policies. We just have to. Thank you. I appreciate yeah. that. Um, I've had some of the best conversations that I've had with, have been with uh, real estate investors such as yourself who've seen these cycles, who've seen um, indicators or predictors of a cycle coming and or the exit. Uh, where are the where are the shoots of growth? What 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 can we look for on the on the on the exit? So um, I believe in in the American spirit. I believe in the uh, millennial and Gen Z spirit. I think technology is hitting real estate in a way that it probably hasn't happened since World War II, and all the technology that came out of World War II that led to the fifties and the you know, communities now that don't seem as suburban, but like Westchester, or you name the Crenshaw area, those were all products of World War II with new technology, uh, dishwashers, all that kind of stuff. I think we're going to have right now coming out of this, whatever we call it, the pandemic recession, a marriage between technology and real estate that wasn't possible before. And when you say, what do you mean wasn't possible? Well, all I know is in February, if I asked my parents to get on a Zoom call, they'd have no clue how to do it, but they do now. And so people are being forced into using technology in a way that they, wouldn't be, that they weren't before. So what I think is going to happen is you're going to see mixed use evolve because of technology, because of um, the way the amount of time in the office will be different than it was before, because people are comfortable now ordering things 
uh, I talk about 2000 web van was one of my favorite things in the world. And the, uh, you could order it and it was the freshest food. It was like whole foods to your house. And then they went bankrupt. But now Instacart, Amazon, they're delivering things. So I think real estate is going to really change. I think there's going to be opportunities when real retail office um, the, and, and multifamily hotel, they're all going to mix a little bit. And I think the people who can figure out how to do it seamlessly are going to make a lot of money coming out of this cycle. I mean, I, as I said, I think 2021 is going to be really tough. It's going to present some buying opportunities in 2022 and 2023. You're going to see this new world post COVID. What's it like when you're not worried about going to a restaurant anymore or going to a, to a sporting event? What's the world going to be like? I think there's going to be so many elements of this mobile workforce work from home that become permanent that it'll be the engaged thinkers who can implement real estate in a new way. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll leave it with this and we can move on from it. The idea that you would drive out to a mall um, and we're a little, uh, I mean, we, we know what the Grove is and we know what the Americana is, so, but not everybody in the country does. The idea that you would get in the car and drive to a mall to only shop for things and then drive home, that's never gonna happen again. You're not gonna do it that way. You know, you'll go to a Americana and have a full experience and it'll be like going to a mini Disneyland. I totally believe that, but you're not gonna go to the old, you know, Sherman Oaks Gal Galleria that doesn't exist anymore anyway, but there's a bunch of those around the country that are just gonna be converted. They're gonna be converted into retail with residential, retail with office. And I, there's gonna be huge opportunities there, I think, uh, in the next few years. Excellent, well well put. I, I haven't heard someone uh, speak to that point so eloquently that I wanna highlight it, that uh, those operators that can make a seamless uh, environment, placemaking, something beyond just going and, and picking something up are, are gonna be the ones that, that come out most successful. Um, how do we measure success moving forward? <laughs> well, that's it. You know, I'm 51 years old, so I'm at that age about thinking about what's what's most important. So, I, you know, I'm measuring success. I think finding a peace and a happiness in your day-to-day -day life is the most important because I, I have seen too many people. I grew up with a pretty amazing father who, who came from nothing and was, was around – unbelievable amounts of uh, uh, power and people who were just players in the business and all that. And I look at him and, I, and love, we talk a lot and all that, but he's 81 and most of those people are gone now, you know? So what the, the stories that he would tell aren't that relevant um, to most people. But when you tell stories about your family and the happiness that that has brought and, and the kind of contributions you can have. Um, my namesake is a guy named Warren Christopher who was secretary of state and in his book, something my father quotes and I quote a lot too, is one cannot be truly successful unless they help others succeed. And I just, I just really believe that because money comes and go. I know it sounds hard to believe, especially if you're 25 years old, you think if you make a bunch of money in your forties, that money's going to be there forever. It doesn't really work out that way. You know, stuff happens that you can't control and people die and, and things happen. So I, I really tell people is you've got to be able to wake up every day and be excited about what you do, about the contributions you're making, about the friendships you have, because a life that's all about making money is not a very happy life. And, um, you know, you might think it's easier, but it's it's not because you're more of a target. There's a lot of things. So I don't know, maybe that's that Jesuit influence when I uh, was in ninth grade and got hit on the hands because I didn't say the rosary correctly. And they've they've hit these things into me, but I really I really believe a success is really going to be determined by determined by yourself, and it really comes down to the impact on, uh, that you have on the people that you love and people around you. Excellent. I've I've heard you mention this that that change. It's a it's a generational change. How we value our time, uh, how we value success. It's it's something. It's it seems to be a question that I've seen you work through and uh, offer a lot of great insight. Thank you. Um, well, hey, if you don't mind, I'll go on a tangent because I can't please. help myself. When, when I was uh, in my late 20s, I graduated from law school. I'd been a lawyer. I was told uh, that, that by a guy named Mike Meyer that, you know, we really do measure about if you come into the office, we want to know. So there's somebody checking when that light goes on. So, you know, if you get in at six, we're noticing. If you stay until nine, we're noticing. When I worked for John Cushman, 
that was absolutely it. You know, you showed up in your suit and tie and you, we think you're successful by the amount of hours you work. I think that that world is totally gone now. I think it's not, it's not the presenteeism that matters. It's the effectiveness of what you do. Are you being efficient? Are you being helpful? Are you being, and it's not so much because I just don't think the, the senior people are in, in the office as much, even in a post COVID world. And so I, I, you know, I would really just say that you really got to be effective. And in a world where you're doing things through Zoom, you probably need to do more than just show up on every Zoom call. You probably may be, need to be willing to make phone calls. And when you can meet for coffees, you got to be willing to do that when it's safe. I'm not encouraging anybody to do anything that's not safe. But I do think that the world is, it's a different world when the baby boomers are being aged out. And you've got, you know, Gen X, Millennials, and Gen Z. Um, so anyway, for whatever that's worth. <laughs> Excellent. Um, you know, I, you mentioned NIMBYism. You mentioned uh, housing, the need for increasing housing. Um, ADUs are a popular way to uh, try and, and bolster housing and the housing, housing numbers that we have. Have you... What what kind of strategies work in terms of conveying the business case for housing and or just any project that you're working yeah. on to perhaps someone who is not a real estate professional, uh, an average Joe, to provide them insight about what, what sort of economic development uh, a Class A office building and or a excellent historic rehab can do like PAC Mutual? Well, I appreciate that uh, you bring in uh, PAC Mutual and the trust building, something else we've done. So I, I really think that where we're headed, um, and I think it's going to become very highlighted over the next four years, um, is that you, you're going to have to make the argument to people that what you're creating isn't harmful. Isn't harmful to the environment in terms of uh, climate change, isn't harmful to the community in terms of it being the super high-end market, only the richest people are there. You're going to have to make a pitch that your project is going to be a positive addition to a community you're in, whether it's office, whether it's retail, or whether, whether it's multifamily. I think you're also going to have to prove up that you're not a polluter and you're not causing damage. So I think all these impact strategies and measurements that we have are gonna become very important. Like you're not gonna get anything approved unless you can prove these things up. I also think that people are gonna be really driven to come up with building technologies that are cheaper. Um, and so whether it's 3D housing, uh, 3D printer housing, whether it's modular housing, um, whether it's building um, uh, projects that have uh, flexibility and use, I was on a call recently with the city of LA on zoning. I'm like saying, you know, I think we got to stop thinking about an office building has to have ground floor retail. I, I, I don't know. I don't know if that's going to work. I think we got to talk about should that ground, couple ground floors be housing? Should that be flex office? I think, I, I think going forward, we're going to have, there's going to be a real demand on moving things away from the traditional way things have been done where housing's over here offices over here, retails over here. It's got to be mixed together. And I think the only way you'll make money is if you can do it uh, more efficiently and more cost effectively. Excellent. Um, one of the through lines that I've seen in your podcast and across any uh, real estate conference, whenever uh, we look to uh, those mentors, it, it happens time and time again, is that we hear the statement, real estate is a business of relationships. How important is your network in doing your job, getting deals done, off market, et cetera? And how could or should students leverage those connections to build their network for a career in real estate? Uh, that's a great question. So I say this often to my two daughters. Um, um, I say it to my son a little bit in the converse, uh, but real estate is finally starting to figure out that they are in the client service business and our clients are not all white male. Um, and I think this is the biggest thing I'd say to a young person. If you are a white male, it doesn't mean there's not a place for you in real estate on what I'm about to say. But there is so many opportunities for women and for people of color in real estate. 
but I can't tell you why people aren't jumping into it. And, and unfortunately, there's not as the, the hiring pool is smaller than we than we would like. But I think there are so many opportunities because at the end of the day, the end user looks like America, whether it's office, retail, multifamily. And um, I think there's tons of opportunity. It doesn't, I'm not trying to say, if, you know, if you're white male, don't look into real estate. I don't mean that at all. Um, but I'm just encouraging people that this industry is evolving. And it's really going to come down to your technological expertise, your ability to be able to run uh, numbers and understand contracts. But it's it's much more open to people than it's ever been before. And I think this recession is going to really there's going to be a lot of opportunities here because um, I, I just I just see it. I can't I can't walk into a meeting without my team. You know our co our company is extremely diverse, but you know I can't walk into a co uh, into a meeting with a tenant and just have have me there. I got to show our team because that's their team's going to, and our team needs to be just as diverse. And so I think there's a lot of opportunity. Um, I do think uh, also we don't quite yet know where this work from home is going. And um, I don't think that we're in the software business where you can just code and not be personable. I think people are going to have to be creative about how they get in front of people because it is a relationship business. It, you know, my lender is a relationship and I would much rather have one lender do all my deals than, than 18 lenders do 18 deals because you have to redo documents all the time. The brokerage community is extraordinarily relationship driven. Um, uh, the architectural community, I mean, cause you gotta come up with different ideas. So, you know, I, I do like this. I mean, I haven't really been in the tech community or in the Hollywood community, but I do like that the real estate business is a business that values those relationships. There will be a day when we go back to you, you know, Urban Land Institute conferences or uh, PREA conferences. Th those days are going to come back because it, those relationships are just too important. Um, so I, I, I would, if someone's, you know, 22 or 25 and saying, uh, "Hey, I want to get in this business," start with ne networking around your own age because you know what happens. I look around the business now at 50. These are all people I've grown up in the business with, and I've, that's where that network starts. You know, when I was 25, I couldn't call someone who was 50 and be their best friend, but you know, hey, it, it grows, and and um, so it is a very, it is a very uh, relationship business, and I don't see how that changes, even in a work from home environment. 100. Um, percent I don't know if it's if it's because I've followed your work or uh, similar, similar companies. Uh, I know that you are 100% tech enabled. I've heard that you don't use email internally for your organization. What was the genesis to that? Was it, was it, uh, you know, not, did you actively decide to not follow the herd? What, what was the, the pivot point for, for you and your organization? I think I talked about this on a podcast, so I, I don't think I'm speaking something that I didn't say before, but it was really, I mean, it comes down to this. When, in 2008, I, I had had my, I had ventured on my own and done a few real estate deals after I uh, left John Cushman, but my father in 2008 was asked to come and be CEO of uh, McGuire Properties, that also means we renamed as MPG Office Trust, and I, I, my job was uh, basically to uh, sell a lot of the assets, but you know, to be a right hand to the CEO and all that. And when we had the senior management there, um, nobody wanted to oversee IT. So I raised my hand and said, I'll, I'll oversee IT. I, I'm interested in that. I'm, you know, my dad and I kid that I did my undergraduate work in Nintendo and my graduate work in PlayStation. So, you know, I played a lot of video games. But what I learned in taking over IT at a public company was that um, email was a horrible way to hold people accountable. And the amount of time we'd have to go back into emails and see that so-and-so said this and so-and-so said that. And, blah, blah. and then what I also learned is, wow, people aren't very, um, they'll say a lot of things in email that they might regret <laughs> if, they, if it was ever exposed. Um, and, and so I, I quickly came to the idea that um, if, you, if, if you're going to assign a task to somebody, you have to be able to track it. You have to be able to have a conversation around it. And so early on, we looked at Microsoft products and all that. When we started our company, we, we did it on a Google background, G Suite. And so we use Asana. 
uh, as our project management. We use Yardi and we use all this. But what I rec what I recognized early is email is a horrible thing for tracking assignments and tracking tasks. You just it just goes pings back and forth, and there's no ability to say you're expected to get this done at this time. And so, you know, we we've hired someone uh, at a pretty senior position and gave them our whole PDF of this is how you use Asana, this is how you do it. And um, he keeps wanting to go back to email when I had to tell a team, we don't respond to that in email. Make sure he gets it in. Because, it, it, I mean, the other thing was the software and all this stuff. If you're not disciplined about its use, it'll never be effective. But I think that's the same for any company operating system. you gotta you got to stick to your routines to it for it to be successful. Excellent. Um, I, I want to highlight that. You have to stick to those routines. You have to stick to your systems to yeah. make sure that, uh, that it has lasting success. You know, we're, we're coming down to the, to the final minutes here. I want to invite and remind any potential students or professionals, if you have a burning question that you'd like to ask, we're very, very happy to have Chris here. Uh, one of the questions that came up is, um, if you, if, if, uh, I, I would love to answer this, but I'll leave it to you. Uh, how do you present, how would you like deals presented to you uh, and or um, how do you underwrite deals briefly for success? Well, you know, our success has been really uh, trying to play in the world of non-marketed deals. Um, and so, you know, what we really love if someone calls and says, hey, I know so-and-so and so-and-so, and this could be a good deal. And maybe you go meet for coffee and see if, see if there's something there. Um, what we tend to do is we call it our, our, you know, just our napkin underwriting, which is basically take the per square foot, whether it's multifamily, industrial, or office, and just, and just break everything down to a per square foot basis. And we could very quickly tell someone, hey, look, you want this, uh, this purchase price, we think it's gonna take this much capital to get to where we need to be. These are the rents we think we can get. And we can do something rather quickly. And those are our favorite deals. Um, so, you know, if someone has a good idea, we'd love to hear it. Uh, it needs to be well thought out. We do get, because of the podcast and all that, I, I've had some pretty crazy deals sent towards me and I've had to be a little more disciplined about who I respond to. Um, but uh, I do forget that, that, that uh, we're only an email away from the outside world and people come up with some pretty uh, interesting things and, and all. But, um, but I would say that uh, one thing I do want to make clear to people is we hire a lot of interns and they tend to come a lot from USC. So I'd love to see more Loyola resumes. Uh, that, that would be a, a great thing. And, you know, it, it isn't good enough to say, hey, I'll just work hard. You need to bring some financial skill set so you can run some numbers or you can do some market research. But, you know, that, we would love to see more resumes from Loyola students and LMU students. So hopefully I answered that the right way. No, 100%. We've, you know, we, I, I want to make sure that we've, we've touched on some of these questions you know, what's the, what are the necessary skill sets that students need to bring to the table to prepare them for a career in investment real estate, commercial real estate? Um, you answered that in part in terms of certification and, and providing uh, basics. What we're going to pivot, I see another question here on the board that asks, if a student wanted to get into REIT investing, how, how would I go about doing that? Is there a different pathway? Is it private equity? What are the opportunities? Yeah, well, re, having worked at a, uh, a public company and my father running too, you know, uh, if you want to get into REIT investing, that is really, you know, kind of investment banking kind of stuff that being a REIT analyst, that's going to, a, you know, Morgan Stanley or something like that and really breaking down. Uh, the great thing about REITs is you can learn everything you want from their 10Q and their 10K. Um, it's really easy. You can just download it and you can get to know the company inside and out really quickly. Uh, if you're looking at REITs today, I mean, you just want to look at strong, durable cash flow, and that's who you want to buy. <laughs> you don't want to buy people who are paying their dividend, their dividends from debt. So you want to buy you want to buy companies that have real, uh, real cash flow that, that you can depend on. Um, so 
but that is a little bit different, uh, you know, than than going and working in a Brookfield or a Blackstone. I'm I'm not sure if you've if you've uh, I'm sure you have, but I still want to ask for for uh, within this environment, what's the mo and you just pick one. What's the most in memorable investment uh, that you've done, deal or even deal point that that always kind of remains in the back of your mind? <laughs> Unfortunately, there's 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 too many on the negative side that that I that I whiffed on because I didn't think five uh, chess moves down the board. Um, so I'll go with the positive one. My still my favorite one was the first deal that I did when I left um, uh, John Cushman, and I was in my early 30s. Um, I had parked my car because my dad was a member at the California Club, so I could have a meeting. And um, the meeting was when I was working for John Cushman, um, we did a lot of work for UBS. We did a lot of uh, work for Credit Suisse and just leasing office space. And a guy that we had worked with, Richard Safer, had just left to become CEO of Oscar De La Hoya's Golden Boy Theaters. And uh, I mean, Go Golden Boy Boxing. I had this idea, well, there's Magic Johnson Theaters. Maybe there should be a Golden Boy Theaters. So I went over to meet with Richard and uh, got the meeting. It was nice enough to take it. And we had this meeting and he says to me, um, well, Chris, give me your idea. I said, well, I think there should be a Golden Boy Theater. He said, great, where? Like, I, had, I don't know yet. I just think it's a great idea. And he's like, oh, okay. And we had a nice conversation. You could tell he was ushering me out the door. And he said, you know, Chris, what we'd really like to do is Oscar would like to buy an office building. And uh, I'm like, wow, well, that's something I, I know a lot about. And I literally go back to get my car and I ran into a guy named Dick Schnell who had been a broker forever. And I worked, worked at Cushman Realty when I was working for John Cushman. And Dick said, Chris, what are you doing now? I said, you know, I'm looking to buy an office building. I, it needs to be about, you know, smaller one, 12 stories. And he goes, you know, about three months ago, I sold one of those to this guy, Michael Barker. He might want to uh, sell. What is, you know, I got, and, and the whole deal came together because I ran into him in the parking lot. And nine months later, and I said to, uh, I, it, what I got Oscar, I think, over, over the hump on why he should buy it was because at the top of 626 Wilshire, there's this gold tile, but the lighting had gone out and they hadn't ever fixed the lighting. And I took uh, Oscar to the building and I said, we'll call it the Golden Boy Building. And we'll have the, gra the, the gold tile lit up and we'll have, you know, a statue in the, in the lobby. And we'll, so we bought that building in 2003. I was able to take a brokerage commission, tie it into the deal. And that was my equity in the deal. And that's what got me on, uh, into the real estate business as a principal. So having kind of big ideas about Golden Boy Theaters and Golden Boy Building allowed me to get my first deal done. That's huge. Thank you so much. Um, I think that's the perfect moment to wrap. We're going we're gonna to put up a QR code for, for students. Chris, uh, we can't thank you enough. We really appreciate your time and your insight. This is, uh, you know, one in a, in, in a series that we're going to be doing. We really appreciate your insight. Well, I appreciate it. I want to tell, tell one story. I, I um... I still remember in 1995 being at the law school campus late at night and looking up at the LA skyline with the US bank tower and all this saying, God, you know, I love being, I loved law school, I really did. Um, but boy, I really wanna get into this business and not knowing how in the world I was ever gonna do it. And um, uh, yeah, my dad was in the business, but you know, nepotism is uh, not a great thing. and. I wanted to do it on my own. And it was because I went to Loyola Marymount and Loyola Law School. And it was because I used that to go work at a law firm to get a skill set that allowed me to get to where I was. And I really encourage people to understand that whether you're an undergrad or you're in grad, grad school, an MBA or getting your law degree, these steps are really important. And it is a step by step. It doesn't happen overnight. Can't do it on the move. So I'm, I'm so grateful for my experience at Loyola Law School. Uh, the professors, the administration have been nothing but supportive. And so I'm, I'm, I'm just excited that you would even want me to do this. Thank you so much. 
again, we appreciate having you. And uh, thank you, everyone, for being a part of this broadcast. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a Thank great you, night. Bye-bye.